Hello and welcome to Virtues of Peace. My name is Hope Elizabeth May and I'm joined by Michael Buzzy, Randy Olson, and I think hopefully Taylor Ackerman will be joining us shortly. We are here on March 1st, 2021. And this show is devoted to the March 1st movement of 1919 in Korea. And this is not South Korea, not just North Korea, but the peninsula as an entirety. If you're rusty on your Korean history, North and South Korea came into existence following World War II in 1945 and basically shortly before the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So around August, late July, the United States drew a line that became an international boundary um, uh, separating North and South Korea. What we're talking about is a very important story from before that moment when the peninsula was united and the Korean kingdom as it was, was in existence for over 4,000 years before it was divided. And in the 1900s, Japan colonized the Korean peninsula. In 1919 on March 1st, so this is the 102nd anniversary of it, the Korean people throughout the peninsula engaged in a nonviolent democratic uprising against Japan. We're gonna be talking about that today. And what we're doing today is presenting our listeners with a different narrative. On the Korean peninsula, the March 1st story is typically portrayed as an nationalist, anti-Japanese movement for self-determination and independence. And while that's not entirely incorrect, it misses a larger vision of this movement, one that places the March 1st movement within the deeper context of international peace history, and in particular, the international peace through law movement. We're gonna be talking about that today and how this moment in March 1st, 1919, helps to move us along in the project of organizing the world, which is one of the key tasks of the peace through law movement. So that's where we're going today. And there are of course show resources at virtuesofpeace.com, a number of different resources for you to do a deeper dive into this story. And um, <clears throat> I, I, I am by no means an expert on the March 1st movement. I have published on, on it, but really to be an expert on the March 1st movement, you really need to know how to read Japanese, Chinese, and Korean, and of course, English. This is really an international story. Um, and so, uh, I have read everything I could find in English, um, as well as had certain things translated from Korean and Chinese into English to, uh, to deepen my understanding. Um, <clears throat> but note that the title of this is Forward into Memory, the March 1st Movement and the Red Thread of the Peace Through Law Movement. So the red thread is a concept that we've talked about on the show numerous times. Again, it's this concept that is proposed by Bertha von Suttner in her memoirs. And she really makes this point about memory and seeing a connecting narrative in what might be regarded as otherwise disparate and unconnected events. And Bertha makes this point that before she started keeping a diary, she really didn't see this connecting line, this connecting thread. And only when she started keeping a diary was she able to sort of do a bird's eye view of all of these different events and see this connecting thread through all of the persons, ideas, institutions, events that comprise the peace through law movement. And so fascinatingly, this individual Hamsa Khan, who we will devote a show or two to in the near future, Hamsa Khan is known as the Korean Gandhi, and he participated in the March 1st movement as a young man. Uh, I think he was 17 or 18 years old when he participates in the March 1st movement. And he 
says things that are very similar to this idea of the red thread. And I just wanted to get these ideas down. Um, and the first is a quote. He says, people in the past all did great things and they must be strung on a string to make beads. Who does the stringing? I must do it. I love this. Um, <clears throat> this is a little bit different than the red thread. They must be strung on a string to make beads. Who does the stringing? I must do it. I think that this quote gets at a more dynamic view of the red thread, that it's not something that's necessarily out there, but I must construct it and create it. And there's also this emphasis on these people people in the past all did great things. So I need to understand the people. I need to understand the individuals and the good things that they did. This is a very different emphasis on history, what we have called positive history. So again, people in the past all did great things. They must be strung on a string to make beads. Who does the stringing? I must do it. That quote, as well as another one, which Michael will read, come from a speech that he gives on March 1st in 1987. This speech had not been translated into English. Um, and so as part of the work that we do, we had it translated into English some years ago. It is a gift that keeps on giving. And so Michael, you have this second quote to read about history. Could you please read that? Yes. The second quote reads, history is like a relay race. You know the relay race? If each person ran individually, the winner would get the prize alone. But in a relay, even if the first person ran and came back, the baton must be handed over to the next person in order for the run to be valid. And the next person must receive it and run with it. If not, it does not matter how much you are ahead of others. That is important. History like a relay race, has the first, second, third, and fourth person, but they are one. Mm, I love that. So this idea of we are part of this relay race, and history is a relay race, and each generation bequeaths to the following generation a task to be carried on. Um, before we switch to the uh, second part of the, the discussion today, I just want to see if anybody has any comments on this idea of the red thread. So like, again, Bertha is the one to state it, but I think that Hamsak Han is developing this idea a little bit more. Um, and I leave it open to anybody to have a comment. Yeah, uh, I'm definitely going to say a few things about that. Um, the first is you know, in the first quote, the, the idea that the individual is responsible for doing the stringing of the beads, so to speak, you know, he's not taking personal responsibility for that and saying he'll do it for everyone. He's acknowledging that every single person in the process of developing their own identity is responsible for understanding history because you need to know how you got to where you are in order to really know where you are. So that's one point. Um, the second point, this bit about the relay race and everyone being part of the same entity, this part of the same chain. I really love this idea um, because it's really easy, especially in the world we live in today, to forget how deeply connected everything is. And I don't want to get like new age spirituality into this mix, but we can't actually do anything in the world without it affecting tens of thousands of others. I mean, every single tweet hits so many people, right? Every time we consume something because we buy it at a store, we're interfacing with, with networks and those networks are connected to systems and those systems are related to an unbelievable amount of things. And so there's like this enormous impact of the individual whether we're conscious of it or not that this idea of history being you know a relay race all pulls into one frame for me this this um 
It's this idea that we have to take our current identity as a historical being and integrate it with the past as a duty, right? And we've talked about this in the past as a duty to remember. And we talked about that a lot in a previous show or two. And um, and the idea is, is pretty straightforward if we, you know, put it in a bullet point that the moral energy of the people in the past is something we must take into account when we're choosing how to act in the present. Because if we don't take it into account, we're not going to make appropriate decisions. And so, I mean, I could keep going, but mm. those three general points I, I think are, you know, they capture the meaning for me. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I have a response, but uh, I just want to check in with Michael. Do you have any reaction? Go ahead. Yeah, the second quote of Hamza Khan's that sort of talks about history is this collective, the relay race one, this collective really resonated with me and reminded me of something that I think you had said maybe a couple months ago on a show, Randy, that history is is mainly like building a cathedral and that it's something that takes generations and it takes decades and each generation puts forth their own stones onto it and then leaves it for the next one to then continue to build upon. But to be able to continue to build upon it, you must know how such a structure began and to know that history is also a duty of yours as well. And only through that process are you then able to be able to continue to build upon it in a proper and meaningful way. And so it's this very constructive aspect. And I think the two quotes as well from this very individualistic one that you as an individual have to come to know this history, but then also recognize yourself as being a part of this greater overall overall arching story is a very collective and very interpersonal way in which to look at the history of it all as well. Indeed. And um, in this speech that Hamsat gives on March, Hamsa Khan gives on March 1st, 1987, he refers, he can't remember his name, but he refers to Viktor Frankl. And he's like this Austrian psychiatrist who talks about meaning. Um, <clears throat> and he's talking about Viktor Frankl and he's talking about man's search for meaning, uh, just a wonderful book. Uh, and Hamsa Khan develops Frankl's idea that apart from you know, our knowing this history, that we're part of this larger project, the duty of that to connect with the moral energy of it, Hamsa Khan says this is really part of a fully meaningful life. And if meaning is the project, as Viktor Frankl says it is, that this is really the the sort of, we have a need, we have a psychological need for meaning. And Hamsa Khan makes the claim that you can't really fully and properly satisfy this psychological need without understanding history and your connection to it. Um, and I just wanted to add that as well. So there's a lot to talk about there, but this is all in way of, um, to talk about the March 1st movement, which most like everybody in Korea knows about the March 1st movement, but very few people outside of Korea know about the March 1st movement. And this is unfortunate for a variety of reasons. The ones we just said that this is a story about individuals. It is a story about moral energy. It is a story of nonviolence. It is a story of another way, um, a different path to take, a path other than revenge and humiliation of our quote unquote enemy, we'll get into that. So this story is so important. If you think that Gandhi is an important figure to understand or Martin Luther King Jr. that these stories, like this is one of those stories. And the other reason why it's important to understand this story um, and fr quite frankly, history, just very, very recently, actually, a professor from Harvard Law School named Mark Ramsire published a couple of articles um, in various law journals and I think an upcoming anthology where his understanding of history was, shall we say, extremely one-sided. 
And he made claims that like the comfort women um, voluntarily chose prostitution. Um, that's one article. Um, another article, he claims things like um, during these riots in Japan, Koreans, you know, were sort of like raping and pillaging people. And his basis for making these claims was, you know, anecdotes from, from Japanese persons that he knows. He used to live in Japan and he was just excoriated. And this is a big story in the Korean press. He was excoriated in the Korean press as being a handmaiden of Japan, that Japan is sort of like using this professor at Harvard to propagate this, this narrative, which has been shown to be false. Now, what's, what's fascinating, we could do you know, many shows on, <laughs> on that because it's, it's, it's huge. There's a recent article in the New Yorker about it actually. But what's interesting is that this professor's article was pulled, not pulled, um, it was pulled for revision by a, a, uh, an anthology published by Cambridge called the Cambridge Handbook of Privatization. The co-editors of this anthology are professors in Israel. And they basically said that like, we, we were not aware, I mean, this is a quote, um, uh, from, from an article. He was fully aware, this is one of the editors of this anthology, he was fully aware about the atrocities against Koreans during World War II, but he and his co-editor were not familiar with historical events before the war during Japan's 1910 to 1945 occupation of the Korean Peninsula. And that right there, just like, <laughs> so I'm like taking a moment to talk about this. Uh, why, did, why is it important to understand the story of the March 1st movement? Number one, it's before World War II. And these are professors, law professors working for Cambridge University Press, and they're not aware of this story uh, before World War II. And this is like such an important moment. We've talked about why it's important to understand history before World War II. There's so much organization of the world that goes on, so many important individuals with moral energy, et cetera. So that's another reason to know <laughs> this story. And what's happened is because these editors didn't know this history, that ignorance becomes a breeding ground for further you know, harms and ignorance <laughs> and really harms to the victims of Japan's atrocities. Um, and so this is another reason why it's so important to know this story before World War II. Um, I know this, we didn't really talk about this as a sort of like, I just decided to add this <laughs> into the conversation. I just wanna see if anybody has a comment on this. Go ahead, Randy. Yeah, I mean, this idea that we need to understand the context of an event in order to understand the event, it should go without saying, but it's something that we all take for granted all the time. And so, you know, I've in the last few months, I know I've had a, a about a, maybe five or six conversations with different people who they realized that Korea was divided but they didn't know why. And then when the conversation came to it, they were like, yeah, well, North and South Korea emerged during World War II, but there was no understanding of what took place in order to make that happen. And it's interesting to think about that, like, because these were intelligent people, right? These are people who have a re reasonably strong grasp of history, as far as I could tell, but there's a, there's a bridge that just doesn't get built in their mind about, the fact that world history didn't begin in the 1940s. And so I, I know we're going to go into that a bit, but um, I'd like to, I'd like to do some of the, some of the construction associated with where, where the international story begins when it, you know, in, in context of the Korean Peninsula and why that's uh, an international story and mm. why that's important to understand if you're interested in where the world is at today and mm. how you can't really understand what's going on in Korea without knowing some of these things that were happening before World War II. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, 
but yeah, that, again, like the I'm, I'm I'm making this point one because it's very timely. It's it's in the press now that like this is happening now, and there's this like deeper story about like the relationship between Korea and Japan. Um, and so this story about the March 1st movement is um, a, a sort of a focal point of that history. Um, it's also a focal point of the history of the United States and Korea, and quite frankly, many other countries. So this is an international story that's extremely important. This is a national holiday in Korea. Um, it's a sacred day. Uh, we, we absolutely need to devote more than one show to it. Um, so we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to the March 1st movement in a moment. I just wanna to turn to Michael to see if he has any uh, comments about this, uh, this recent <clears throat> event, yeah. Certainly, and I think it really ties into, and it speaks to the importance of coming to know this red thread, this interconnectedness of history and to the first Hamsak Han quote as well, that it is this very individualistic duty by which you must come to understand all of these background details and the overarching picture that exists. And yeah, many individuals that I've spoken to as well, their main conceptualization of world history is everything post 1941. And so for them, for so anything that kind of resides be, back in history beyond that sort of 1910s and such, it just doesn't really resonate with them. It's kind of like this separate break that the thread that contains the beads, it's like it's two separate entities for them. And so to really go through that process of connecting those is important. And I'm, it also speaks to the duty by which you will also come to dispel your own personal ignorance. And I think that's also a really important undertaking for many individuals as well. And a lifelong and continuous duty, <laughs> I would say, because we're always we're always going to be ignorant. Um, <clears throat> cool. So let's let's turn to the March first movement itself. And um, again, so we've talked about the red thread. This is like a core concept that we use to organize the chaos, if you will. And another uh, concept that we use to organize the chaos is this idea of entering the forest. And that is the idea of, okay, there's this thing that happens March 1st, 1919. Where do we begin? Um, where do we begin that narrative? When do we begin? What do we focus on? So this is this idea of entering the forest and to connect it to this earlier quote from Hamsa Khan, who does the stringing? I must do it. You must enter the forest. You must decide you know, when to begin the narrative. So we are um, very conscious of like it, it, it matters when you begin the narrative. And a lot of people, when they're talking about March 1st, they begin the narrative with Woodrow Wilson's 14 points speech to the US Congress in 1918. This is a very fine place to begin the narrative, but where we are not going to begin the narrative there. But FYI, um, Woodrow Wilson, that is, you know, United States president who was now also under, you know, great criticism for his views. Uh, we won't go there, <laughs> but, but um, he gives this speech and it's 1918. The United States has entered World War I. We enter in 1917. World War I starts in Europe in 1914. And what Woodrow Wilson does in this speech is basically lay out a new vision. He lays out a new vision for the organization of the world. There's not gonna be any war. There's going to be a, a League of Nations. There's going to be an international court that settles disputes, etc. And this idea, it's amazing, okay? It travels, it travels all the way to China and it lands on the mind of Korean students who are in China. I'm not gonna like, we can begin there, you see. But as Randy said, <laughs> there's like other places that we can begin, um, but that's one place and I'll just mark that. But Randy, you had some other you know, moments that we could try to understand the, the deeper context of, of March 1st, go for it. Sure. Um, so one of the things that, you know, when I went to a public school, right, I grew up in a place where the stories of history were marked by battles. They were marked by war. And, you know, 
despite the fact that we're going to be concentrating on like the stories associated with peace, I mean, we can still fit information into that frame and make a story that's intelligible to, to people. And that's my goal here. So, you know, it's important to know that for like 400 years before the time frame we're interested in, Korea was basically a tributary state to China, right? Uh, and so what is it? It's, it's the, in, in 1636, right? China invades the Korean peninsula and basically owns the peninsula whenever they want, right? So there, it's this idea of being a tributary state. And it stays this way. Like this is the relationship of Korea to the rest of the world through China for the next 370 years. And so there's this moment, right? This, this focal point that we're going to zoom into, which I'm not an expert on, but I, you know, I have a, enough information to make a story about is this uh, Dong Hawk a peasant revolution or peasant revolt, or it's called a bunch of other names, but it, it's in, it begins in January of 1894. It's this moment when a bunch of stuff is happening in the Korean Peninsula. And one of the things is this revolt. The Korean citizens are trying to resist the influence of foreign powers on their in their country, right? There's the Chinese who have been, uh, you know, a, a ruling power over them, like colonizers, basically, for hundreds of years and then japan on the other side on the east side coming in and saying okay well now we're going to exert power over you too and the korean people are stuck in the middle saying hey we don't really want that let's see if we can defend ourselves and so there's a bunch of different ways we can look at that moment now it's not just those powers right because there's there's all these other things happening that make this this international conflict but basically that that peasant revolt that's happening and it begins in 1894 goes until 1895 um, that's like the beginning of the big war that takes place between japan and china so korea is just stuck in the middle geographically between these large militaristic you know forces so you know if we fast forward a little bit we start to see how this becomes this international moment so if we think about geography for a second, there's a spot north of Korea that it's like it's technically Chinese territory, right? It's called Manchuria. It's like it's a part of China. And Manchuria geographically is the place between which Russia and like the big trade routes associated with the Pacific Ocean all would intersect. So towards the towards the end towards the end of the century, Russia is interested in moving south and acquiring, you know, economic advantages, for lack of a better phrase. Japan's trying to move west and take those same sets of economic territories. And then China's trying to hold on to what they have. And there's all this there's this big concentration on who's gonna own Korea. Because Korea and Manchuria above it are this really, really important place geographically. And we get this moment um, a few years into this where, you know, we can talk about it from a whole bunch of different directions. But like within a short frame, there's a bunch of conflicts that lead to eventually a justification for an all out war between Japan and China that Japan ends up kind of coming out on top of. And so as part of this whole situation, Korea is trying to defend itself, doesn't do, doesn't succeed. And Japan ends up becoming the colonial power and then progresses along this Japanese, uh, Japan in ization process. I can't say that word making the Korean culture more Japanese from 1897 all the way through 1907. It's the uh, Gwangmu reform. Now, I don't know enough about that, but I know that we have this war zone that Japan comes out on top of and they start to make Korea more Japanese. And the Korean people are like, 
hi, we don't really want this to happen. Mm-hmm. So there's more information that's obviously packaged into this, but the the process of J- of Japan becoming more and more brutal with this process of basically eradicating Korean culture accelerates all the way until 1919. Mm -hmm. So there are more details to this as to what's going on during World War I and why Japan and Korea are involved in that conflict. But we just have to know that, okay, Japan is the colonial power on the Korean Peninsula for all of these reasons. There's all this other international stuff going on. And as part of being the colonial power, they're exerting an ever increasing amount of control over the culture in Korea. And the people by 1919 have had enough and they start to resist. Mm. Yeah. And um, thank you for that. And so again, like this is all way before World War II and it's before World War I. And you can see that, okay, I could begin with Woodrow Wilson or I could begin with the Dong Hawk Rebellion, 1894. I also want to throw in there um, that you know, in 1896, 1897, Sojay Pill, who's known in the United States as Philip Jason, I mean, what he, he tries to cultivate the Koreans to democracy, to being able to debate parliamentary procedure he introduces. He introduces the first Korean language newspaper. Um, now, what I find fascinating is that when he like and like he's part of a failed coup against Japan, <laughs> oh, it's just a long story. Um, but when he he does this, um, he he has been exiled. Like he's been exiled from Korea for like doing this failed coup um, that Japan organized against against China. Um, he becomes an American citizen, and he goes back to Korea as an American citizen in, I think he goes back in like 1896 or five, and he does all of this as an American citizen. I think this is, this fact is lost on people. He is the first Korean to become an American citizen. And hopefully we'll talk about him on some future shows, but there's all of this like democratic work that he does in 1896, 1897. And it's just like too radical and he gets kicked out again. Long story there, but you see, this is way before Woodrow Wilson. And um, the other thing I want to say is like another really important part of this piece to understanding the the Koreans' ire. And really, quite frankly, the need to have justice. This is a movement. I, I think look at the March 1st movement as a movement of international justice and pointing to the lack, the lacuna in the in the machinery of the world. Um, because as we've discussed on this show, in 1899, we have the permanent court of arbitration that's developed. So there is like an international court that exists. And the second Hague Peace Conference of 1907, Koreans do go there as like a seat. They, like, they go behind Japan's back. <laughs> it's just an incredible story. They go behind Japan's back. They're helped by American Hol- Homer Holbert. And they go to The Hague to like get a hearing with the international community. Like, yo, like Japan is violating its agreements with us because the Japan, we we didn't mention the the Russo-Japanese war. Um, Korea basically said, okay, Japan, you can use our territory to fight against Russia. And Japan never left. They never left. They took that moment in 1905 to sort of in, like deepen their, their hold on the peninsula. And it's really 1905 that you start to see an appeal to the world by Korea. That is, we need to like get help. And the United States was one of several countries that was obliged to help Korea through a, through, through a treaty. Um, treaty was signed in 1882. So the United States promised, okay, if another country messes with you, we'll come and help you. So in 1905, they're like knocking on the door. Homer Holbert goes to try to get an audience with, with Theodore Roosevelt. We need help. And like, he's ignored. Fast forward to 1907. Okay, let's try the international community. 
they're ignored because by that time, the international community had really sided with Japan because they were the new kid on the block after the Russo-Japanese War. They, in a tremendous upset, beat Russia. <laughs> so it's like, who is this you know, new kid on the block? And based, it's a, such a long story, but right, this is like, we just don't know this background history. And so there's a couple of things going on here. There's, you know, there's just like the culture uh, and the humiliation that's going on um, from Japan's bullying, quite frankly. And then there's the fact that they're not, they're, they're, they're being ignored by the rest of the world, okay? So in 1919, what's happening? The Treaty of Versailles is happening. So like the world powers are meeting in France at the end of World War I. This, it's not like, this was very intentionally timed. Like this is the moment to like do a big shout out to the world to get the attention on us. And if you've seen the movie Selma, um, you know, about Martin Luther King and the march from Selma to Montgomery, Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement strategically used the media that is, they would organize these nonviolent protests, actions. And the hope was, was, and they knew that like there was going to be violence and brutality. And the strategy was, we're not going to fight back. And this is going to outrage people so much that they're going to like contact their representatives, et cetera. And this was exactly the thinking behind the March 1st movement. It was, we are, we're going to like do this thing. We're going to do something nonviolent. We're going to march and we're going to recite our Declaration of Independence. We're going to wave the Teguki, the Korean flag, which was forbidden. Like this is like doing this was not, <laughs> was very, very risky, very risky. Um, we're gonna do this and we're going to get people to take pictures and people did take pictures and they were smuggled out of the country. And we're going to raise the consciousness of the world as to how awful this is. And then they'll do something at the Paris Peace Conference. The other thing is that, as I mentioned, Woodrow Wilson's 14 point speech, um, when Korean students heard this in China, because there was you know, someone named Charles Crane who was like making the rounds. And um, he, was going, he was going around China and giving talks about Woodrow Wilson's vision and in the audience was um, a Korean student. And he was just like blown away at, at this vision. And so he started to organize. It was the Young, Men, Young Korean Men's Christian Association. And he started to organize his, uh, like his, his, his fellow st Korean student. I mean, it's just an incredible story. And they uh, managed to send someone to the Paris Peace Conference. Like he gets on, the, he gets on a ship, you know, disguised as a Chinese. Um, and while he's at sea, the March 1st movement happens. I think he arrives in Paris in like in March, March 13th, maybe in 1919. And so like these students are doing all of this stuff. Um, and so this is done to get the world's attention and to get the world leaders to do something while they're meeting to reorganize the world. So that's like why the timing of this. And that's why typically people begin with Woodrow Wilson's 14 point speech and this idea, the sort of like new world order that, that is understood by Korean students. I'll stop talking, I've been talking for way too long. I don't see if anybody has anything to add. I mean, I'll definitely, I'll definitely, you know, follow suit and talk for way too long uh, because there's so much to say, but the thing that I want to stress is, you know, we've talked about in the past on the show, the importance of promise keeping and the, the, the thing we're supposed to be doing after we commit to a certain set of ideas in a treaty or in a legal document. And like this, the, the Korean story is so cool because it's this, it's this perfect example of what happens when treaties get ignored after they're signed like the United States promises to help Korea 
and then nothing happens when they call for help. And then the Korean people just get, you know, stomped on. And then later the Japanese uh, basically, and this is a controversial way to, you know, talk about it, but in 1905, the Ulsa Treaty, um, basically the Japanese have some <laughs> stiff armed uh, suggestions so that the Korean emperor signs away all diplomatic rights. Just right. That's why the, like the Korean emissaries aren't allowed in, in 1907 at the second Hague peace conference. Right. And all of this, this like this relationship between uh, the citizens and the treaties that get either signed illegally or the treaties that get signed and then ignored. It's like, there's this amazing relationship that's so direct and so clear when we think about Korea, because we can see how, okay, this broken promise has led to this many bodies. And I mean, it's not quite that cut and dry, but it's close. And I mean, I know that this whole story is captured in uh, it's an amazing little building in the Hague. It's the Yijun Peace Museum where, the Korean emissary, or one of the Korean emissaries who sent in order to appeal to the world is actually assassinated in his hotel room. I mean, like, we, you can't make this up. Like, it seems like a movie, but no, this actually took place. And this is actually the, the foundation of the international community. And this is, this is how we got to where we are in a very real way. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this point about the importance of, of keeping your promises. And let's not like we and, and you in particular, Randy, have have, you know, driven home the important point about like it starts with individuals. Right. Um, and so let us all like do better at, you know, keeping our promises. And what, what happens when Homer Holbert goes to the State Department and he's like, yo, uh, Y'all signed this treaty in 1882. And I'm sorry to say, Randy, I know like we, we're both fans of Elihu Root. Um, he meets with Elihu Root and um, Elihu Root says, I didn't know about that. <laughs> okay. It's not like, perfect, you know. But, but see, this is the point. Like, like sometimes we forget our commitments and like we have to we have to do better at at remembering what like what we promised and um i i can just speak about it as you know on the personal level that i'm i'm guilty of that um that i make certain you know commitments and then i forget them and i'm, I'm trying to do better but I, I think it starts with the individual and um this really has to do with with cultivating the very important value of trust um, and then without trust, you really like we can't we cannot flourish without trust. I just uh, turn it over to Michael to see if you have any comment. I think the whole you, all the points in the history that you hope and you, Randy, have laid out over the course of, like the past 10, 15 minutes, it truly just speaks to the importance of come to know all of the intricate details. Oh my goodness. Any one of those points that you have both said could have been a point of entry or a point in which someone enters the forest of this immensely complex and also very profound and meaningful history that can be used to, that can be used as a lens to help us see through our modern times as well. And it truly just speaks to the whole importance of what we've talked about so far is coming to know the history. And I know for me, that was something that really stood out. So, no, I thank you both for being the docents to help administer this history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our, our honor. Um, so, right, we've been talking about like different, different, we're talking about a landscape of story, an ocean, and we're focused, we've been focusing on like certain, you know, zones or drops in the ocean, if you will. Um, and so you have to pick a point as to where you begin the story. Um, that story is typically begin, as, as I mentioned, with Woodrow Wilson in 1918, and that this idea sort of travels and helps Koreans organize to do this nonviolent uprising, because that was the, the flavor of the day, if you will. There was a peace movement. There was an organization of the world. There were the Hague Peace Conferences. And so there was this, this sentiment. Um, and when we get to the, the um, March 1st Declaration, 
we will see that there's a great consciousness of this humanitarian noble work on which the March 1st movement is building and carrying further. Um, so we talked about how Korea's, Korea goes to the 1907 Hague Peace Conference. And I wanna say what's, <clears throat> what's really interesting, and I, on our show resources page, there's a small article, um, a newspaper article from 1907, July. And it mentions how the Koreans met with Bertha von Suttner. And the Koreans go to the 1907 Hague Peace Conference um, in part to, to sort of like remind other countries like, because it wasn't just the United States that had pledged to help Korea. It was other countries as well. I won't name names, but they were at the 1907 Hague Peace Conference. So it's like to remind the other countries like, hey, you know, you signed this treaty with us, but also to appeal to the permanent court of arbitration. There was an international court and they were told like, it's the wrong court. Um, and so the, the peace movement who does, and like the peace movement, like the Koreans can't participate in the 1907 Hague Peace Conference. Japan basically gets the other countries to agree, let's not let them in. And so who hears them but the organized peace movement. I think this is so important. And so there's like a talk that they give and Bertha von Suttner, who by that time has won the Nobel Peace Prize. This is 1907. So they meet with like a Nobel laureate. There's a future Nobel laureate in the audience. This is like the, like the movers and shakers of the peace through law movement. Who hears the Korean delegation? They do, and they write the story. So this has been documented in their, their newsletters and so forth. They took pictures. Big shout out to William Stead, who organized it all. Um, but what's interesting is they go because they think maybe like the permanent court of arbitration, this new international court can give us justice. And so they're told in 1907, this is not the right, like you can't use this court. It's not the right kind of court. And Bertha and the rest of the peace movement say, we really hope that the world organizes to create the right kind of court where Korea could actually be heard. And so this is like fast forward to 1919, that's what's happening. So Woodrow Wilson is proposing the creation of yet another court to the international machinery. So this would be the permanent court of international justice. So the Koreans know this is on the horizon, that this is like they're, they're, they're organizing to create this new world order. So now's the time again to like be heard by these diplomats in Paris organizing the world after World War I. So again, this is, I, I like to understand this as really a moment in the development of international justice and the part of like being heard and getting redress or a remedy for violations. And at the very least, you know, unkept promises. So what relief does Korea have if for example, the United States is breaking its promises to Korea? At that time, there is none. Now we have the International Court of Justice, but that has its own problems um, with jurisdiction. So yeah, I, I just wanna portray the movement as, as this sort of like stage in the development of international justice and also international peace because it's a nonviolent movement. And to really drive home that point, we're gonna look at um, certain sentences in the March 1st, 1919 declaration, an incredible document. I mean, please like download, we have a, a link to the document on our show resources page. Everybody should read this. It's, it doesn't take a long time to read, but the sentiments that are expressed in this document are so forward thinking. It's Nelson Mandela, who's typically credited with a quote, new approach of like reconciliation and forgiveness to, to harm and atrocity. Well, this Korean declaration of 1919 is you know well before that articulation. And it's a document that's stressing reconciliation, peace, togetherness, universal belonging, et cetera. It's really an amazing document. So, um, just real quick. Yeah, go let ahead. Me, let me let me color in some uh, some some detail here. 
you know, so we've been talking about Korea on the like the national scale and at the, you know, the relationship between Korea and the other foreign powers at this, you know, big top down frame. But, you know, the fact that it's happening top down doesn't take any t- take anything away. Like there's boots on the ground doing all kinds of amazing things. So the actual March 1st movement, you know, there's there. I, I know the numbers vary, but the last time the last number I remember was in the millions, right? A huge number of Korean people are part of this, this event. And one of the things that happens and like, it's important to remember that it's super, super illegal to do this, right? Because Japan has been brutally like kind of preventing Koreans from doing anything Korean. You don't get to speak in Korean. You don't get to name your children with Korean names. You don't get to have Korean schools. You don't get to talk about Korean history. Like that's off limits. Literally, it's a crime, right? And so this big thing where Koreans are starting to resist and stand up for themselves has been brewing over the last few years. And then especially it accelerates over the last few months from Woodrow Wilson's speech forward, which we talked about. And then on this, you know, this actual movement, there's this declaration that's part of the equation. It's kind of the equivalent of, you know, the Declaration of Independence, in the United States, right? It's the same kind of gesture where we will, we, we want to be our own, our own makers. And so like, that's, this is, this is the crescendo, so to speak, of the, the intellectual side of the movement. I don't know if that's, that's my interpretation of it anyway. So I, anyway, anyway. Cool. Yeah, so thanks on that. Uh, so this is, you know, I refer to the March 1st Declaration of 1919 as um, one of their documents to freedom. Shortly thereafter, they um, put forward the Constitution of the Republic of Korea, and that's April 11th, another sacred day in Korean history. They, they like, propose a constitution. And this is uh, March 1st is also the beginning of Women's History Month, and forever for the rest of my life, March 1st, and women's history will be entwined because the Korean constitution of April 11th, 1919 recognizes the political equality of women before the United States constitution does on August 26th, 1920. So so like shout out to the Koreans for, um, you know, recognizing that before the United States does in their constitution. now, of course, the colonial period will, would, will not end until 1945, right, um, when Japan surrenders, and that's when the United States divides the country. Oh, so much to talk about. Let's, but let's, um, let's look at some of the ideas in the Declaration. Um, and so, Michael, we're going to start with, um, you, we each like picked a sentence or two to talk about. And so, uh, Michael, if you could read your sentence and then um, elaborate on it. Yeah, surely. So my sentence from the Declaration of Korean Independence is, today our responsibility solely lies in the construction of self, never in the destruction of others. And I think this sentence in particular, for me personally, really encapsulated what this, like you said, Hope, this document is so forward thinking. It feels so beyond when the time period in which it was created, just from the sense that the Korean people suffered horrendously under Japanese occupation. They were brutally humiliated. They, the whole of the Korean people were like unintended, unintendedly lowered against their will. And for them to have crafted something that was just so in a way, very stoic, it struck me as that they will, you know, uh, things outside of our circumstances, we do not have control, but we can control our actions and our thoughts. And we are going to go forward in a way that is not going to continue to sow the seeds of violence and terror and destruction that have impacted us so that they're not going to further this, I think I've mentioned before, this political science concept of blowback where, you know, you will retaliate because you have been harmed or you need to, you know, in in some way save your national identity by being overly violent and brutal and seeking vengeance against those who have harmed you so. But for them, it also very much struck me as similar to the Hibakusha movement that Japan, the individuals who survived the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, for them to have 
gone forward with this very much worldview oriented sense that we are not going to seek retribution against those who committed this tremendous harm against us, but we're going to go forward in a sense of peace, that we are going to go forward in a sense of uniting the world and our people around this sense of creating a society and a world community in which such atrocities will not ever have to occur again. And so, and I think that, as we've said many times on the show, that is a very individualistic process. And I think that that line, the construction of self really plays into that, that it has to be a personal paradigm shift to move away from something that would be sort of this nationalistic tendency to seek retribution against the Japanese, but to take within yourself, which was why it struck me as very stoic, that you have control over your own actions and your own thoughts and to step forward in a way that is constructive and not one that would seek to perpetuate further harm in the same way in which that has been done on to you. Cool. Yeah. And um, I know that the sentence that I picked, Randy also picked, which totally relates to what you're talking about, Michael. Um, and there, the sentence that I picked, and again, Randy will also speak to this, is busy with rebuking ourselves. We cannot blame others. I mean, that, that's it. <laughs> um, busy with rebuking ourselves we cannot blame others. And so Michael, you mentioned the Habaksha and this, they call it critical self-reflection. And I have you know, carried that wisdom into my own life by forming the phrase that I try to remember as much as possible, which is instead of blame, reflect. So instead of blame, reflect, busy with rebuking ourselves, we cannot blame others. And so this focus on blame, um, and that's not this, the source, the focus of blame is not the other. The focus of blame is on oneself. Now that's kind of a hard pill to swallow if you're a victim, but this is exactly what the declaration says. So um, I just think that that fact is worthy of, of focus and discussion. And to me, I understand this is sort of like, forgive them, Father, they know, know, what, they know not what they do. I, I understand this as sort of, um, you know, a moment where the Koreans are saying, you know, Japan, you haven't gotten the memo. Like, like the world is moving in a different direction. And you're, you're like hung up on militarism. And this thing is, this is fading. This is fading. There's like a new spirit. There's a new force on the horizon. And this is where the world is headed. And we would like to help you wake up to that fact. So instead of saying shame on you, you know, you're ignorant and you're, you're harming us that um, we're here to help. And like, let's go forward into this new world. It's a, it's a defining moment, the end of World War I. Let's do it. So, Randy, you also had this sentence, and maybe you want to say a few more things. Yeah. Um, so the this idea of blame, first of all, this idea of well, it's you know, it's easy to say, hey, it's this person's fault that we're feeling this way, or this situation got to be the way that it is because of this person. And like this, this, I, this whole frame of like not taking personal responsibility for the way things are right now. That's a whole, that's like the Korean declaration just clearly points to how that's the past. And now it's like, okay, look, we're going to carry our load. We're going to say that we have a, we have a duty here to raise our own to raise our own nation out of the, the circumstances that it's in. It's, it's on us and the things that the other people have done is not the thing we're going to focus on. And, you know, my, my easy example is I spend a, f a fair amount of time with children nowadays. It's like when a child goes, but he did it. Right. And it's like, like there's a clearly a mess on the floor, right? And then like the kid points at the other kid and says, it's his fault. No, it's his fault. It's like that conversation never goes anywhere. It takes the, the like slightly more 
at least older person to come in and say, look, it's not about who started it. It's like, how are we going to clean this up? And who's going to participate? Who's going to pick up the broom or whatever? And so it's like, it's important to just have this radical ownership, this radical personal responsibility. And the fact that the Koreans put that into a document and said it explicitly so poignant, poignantly um, for me is really, that's why I wanted to share it. I wanted to talk about it. And it seems like a, a, the appropriate place now. Um, I selected that sentence and then a separate one. So I'm going to go into that. It's actually the very next sentence in the declaration. Busy with preparing the present, we cannot condemn the recent past. And so, you know, there's there's so much to do when it comes to kind of rebuilding a nation. There's so much to do when it comes to like transforming a place into like a, a sanctuary for new ideas. And Korea is clearly like ahead of its time in the way that it's thinking, but its infrastructure needs all of this work. In Japan, I mean, during during the previous 20 years or so, Japan was putting all kinds of energy into modernizing the actual peninsula technologically. And the Koreans, you know, they, they were the ones doing that work, right? And so they realize how much there is to do. And the, the, the theme of this document consistently is we've got things to do. We can't worry about how things got this way. And it's not a neglect, right? It's not that we don't care about history. It's not that we don't need to know that it got this way because of this this path the word here is condemn right it's not it's not a you did this wrong and we're going to hate you forever for it which there's yeah there's just this very advanced morality that's present in the document that um yeah that that's a good place for me yeah um and i really yeah the, this point about we're not here to blame and condemn because that like when you're focused on that if that's where your attention and energy is focused on i i'm gonna make the the bold conjecture that that's actually inconsistent with the kind of energy that you need to build um and the task here is to build. And it's not just to build a country, it's to build people. We're gonna come back to that idea uh, when we talk about Hamsa Khan in a couple of weeks, but this like construction of character, the construction of self and focus, being focused on blame is not how you construct the self. Uh, I, I, yeah, I just, I think we should all meditate on that and then come back and, and discuss it. And um, apart from the, the ideas in the declaration that we've been talking about, I also want to talk about some of the people. And it's really like, as we've said on this show, um, that's where the gold is. Like when you start to understand how an individual worked, what they did to make this movement possible. And this is not just one person. Um, so there was, you know, Che Nam San drafted the Declaration of Independence. So there was that task and that went through various revisions. And then there were people who, who printed it. And the story of like the construction of the declaration, the printing of it, the distribution of this very secretly, it's all of these individual people who are involved in this. And I just want to um, focus on a couple of them. First of all, on our show resources page, you can access really in the Korean consciousness, it's this young woman named Yu Guan Soon. There's a, a documentary about her on our show resources page. There's a New York Times article on our show resources page. Today, actually, in the state of New York is Yu Guan Soon Day. Um, and Yu Guan Soon was the 16-year-old girl who participated in the March 1st movement in Seoul 
um, and the Japanese caused all of the schools to be closed as a sort of you know punishment for the Koreans doing this. And the children had to go home. And so she was not from Seoul. She was from a village called Chonan, which I don't know, it's like an hour on the train. Um, so she had, she went back home and when she did, she had a copy of the declaration with her and she organized villages in her town. I think it was 24 different villages that she organizes. She organizes it on April 1st, which then was the Lunar New Year. That was March 1st in the, in the um, lunar calendar. So she organizes 16 years old. Her parents get killed, her friends get killed. She gets arrested. She gets brought back to Soda Moon prison she's tortured and she dies there as an 18 year old um, in, in 1920. Um, so that's Yu Guan Soon, learn more about her. Um, the other person I wanna mention, and I just wanna say like this person, um, he is really not, not known. Um, by uh, Westerners and by very few Koreans. The way that I found him, I think is, is worth talking about. His name is Shin Cho. And um, the best work on the March 1st movement in English is a dissertation written by someone named Frank Baldwin. Um, Frank Baldwin was, I believe, the dissertation advisor of Bruce Cummings, who's now the, the foremost American expert on things Korea. He's at the University of Chicago. Um, so Frank Baldwin was his dissertation advisor, I'm pretty sure. So Frank Baldwin um, wrote a dissertation on the March 1st movement um, when he was a graduate student at Columbia University. And in a footnote, <laughs> So we, uh, we've talked about footnotes and we just, you know, recently did a show with Sandra Weber and how she was following a footnote and that led her to the, the, um, the portrait monument, the women's suffrage statue. And so we, we've talked about the importance of like doing your diligence and doing your homework and following the leads and following the threads, which is time consuming, but absolutely necessary to excavate the ocean of information. So in a footnote to Frank Baldwin's dissertation, he refers to a man, a, Japan, a Korean working for the Japanese. And by the way, this is a sad thing in Korean society where they're called collaborators. And these are Koreans who quote, assisted uh, Japan in their colonial apparatus. And so you had Koreans working for the Japanese police. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's such a long story. So there was um, his, a, a Korean working for the Japanese police. He gets wind, like there's some suspicion that something's gonna happen on March 1st. And he gets a tip that they're printing the declaration. Um, I, we did not mention that this is an interfaith movement, which is another fascinating aspect of this story that it's Christians, Buddhists, and Shondogyo, and Shondogyo is an indigenous Korean religion. And all of these religious leaders participate and organize the peninsula. So that's another dimension that we have not mentioned, but it's the Shondogyo. They have a printing press and they decide, at, you know, at great risk to print this declaration. Um, and so this Japanese policeman, he's Korean, but he's working for the Japanese police a Korean walks in and sort of catches them red-handed. What does he do? Um, he does nothing. <laughs> like he doesn't, he doesn't rat, if you will. And uh, I've written about this. I, I think that something happens when he walks in to that printing press because um, one of the signers is, is standing there with him and says, look, I'm a Korean and I've put my name to this document and like, I'm risking my life. And like the least you could do as a Korean is just not say anything. And if you want, we'll give you money um, and help you escape and like start, start to live a, a different life. And um, he, he agrees. And those few people who talk about Shin Shol say, oh, he was a bad guy. He took a bribe. Regardless, he does not say anything. 
And so like his silence is so important. Like had he said something, we would not have the declaration. The, mo the movement would not have happened. But like the, the formative role of his silence and him, I, I just want to draw attention to. And it's in Frank Baldwin's dissertation, um, he does not mention his name. And so it was just working with, I must you know, credit Maria on, uh, who used to work very closely with this project um, when she was a student at the Graduate Institute of Peace Studies. She helped me you know, uncover his name Shin Shou. Um, before it was just like this Korean detective working for the Japanese police, but now we have a name. Um, and Frank Baldwin, you know what, what I want to share. I'm sorry if like this is too, this too like uh, being like a, a geek about footnotes. But again, I just like I'm making this point to talk about how buried this stuff is and how you really do need to know not just Korean but also Chinese because what happened in the research of this guy was yeah, Frank Baldwin being a good scholar refers to the source of his information about Shin Shol. okay? So this is a book in Korean, but there's a lot of older books in Korean that are also that, that use Chinese characters. And older people in Korea are taught to read Chinese, but the younger generation does not know. Um, they cannot read Chinese. The Declaration of Independence I'm virtually certain that it's written in Chinese characters. It's not even written in Hangul, which is a Korean character. It's written in Chinese characters because that was like the language that of, of the, in, the, the intellectuals and the academics. Um, so if you, if you follow the thread of Frank Baldwin's footnote to the source in this book in Korean, it's in Chinese. And so when I gave it to my Korean students, they're like, well, I don't know, it's in Chinese, I can't read it. So I had to give it to someone older who could understand uh, and read Chinese. And so yes, Shin Shol um, is in Chinese. <laughs> so, so my point is it's so, it's so buried. Um, and I just wanna you know, acknowledge Frank Baldwin's footnote for, uh, for helping us to excavate that story. And so like Yu Guan Soon, like to contra contrast Yu Guan Soon with Shin Shoul, Yu Guan Soon like participates. She, she like, she marches through the streets of Seoul. She goes back to her hometown, she organizes. So there's like that activity, there's that contribution of an individual. And then there's Shin Shoul who doesn't organize. He goes into the printing press and decides to keep silence. And by the way, he's, he's killed, he, he flees to the northern part of Korea and, and he's killed. Um, and so I will stop talking about these individuals and there's so many stories like this, right? And I think like that's where the real gold is when you start to understand how these different individuals contributed to this, this larger story. I'll stop and go ahead, Randy. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it would be possible to have a more direct uh, comparison to the quote from earlier about history being like a relay race where the language barrier like gets unpacked in that way where e even to understand the document that you find after digging and digging and digging you, it requires you reaching out to an older generation who might have the ability to read the text because like the the fact that it was you know it wasn't even written in korean like that that says so much to me and and so i'd like to step back for a second and, and just point out this this big tapestry that's being woven together of individual stories and it's so cool to me like you have you have these young people who are who are born into a world where the first half of their lives is, you know, this Korean world. And then the second half of their lives is this Japanese world that's being kind of forced upon them. And they're like, enough's enough. And so some of the Chinese or some of the Koreans who are studying in China get mobilized and try to do something. And then there's, you know, people in small towns all over who are like, you know, we can get together and do something. 
And then there's people inside the cities who are like industrializing the printing presses that they have access to in order to get lots of these documents printed. And there's all these little individual activities that are part of this large, you know, tapestry that ends up coming forward in, in March 1st of 1919. And it brings these beautiful ideas forward. And it doesn't just take the piece of paper and like throw it on the street. You know, it's like it's bringing it into the world. It's giving birth to these new ideas in a place that's being ruled in the old way. And there's something so beautiful about that. I mean, it's the fact that it's happening on the, you know, at the new year. It's happening at the beginning of springtime. It's right in line with the cycles of the entire planet, both like uh, like in terms of the seasons, in terms of the like you probably probably a hundred other ways that it connects that I can't generate on the fly. But it's so amazing that all these things are taking place and it's in its small, it's small places, small groups of people all working as part of a greater idea, part of a greater, you know, call it a zeitgeist, right? This, this spirit of the age. And I love that. I, I don't know how else to say it. Yeah, I, I, I think I've used this, this expression on this show several times. The extraordinary and the ordinary. Um, like that's where it happens in like the ordinariness of life, um, this extraordinary thing. And what's making it all possible is promise keeping. Um, that there was, you know, the Koreans kept their promise to each other. Uh, Shin Chol kept his promise. So this is like the seed bed of trust. You know, that's where magic can happen if there is such a seed bed. Um, and that's what's going on here. And so you have like the rest of the world is you know in this like mindset of revenge and humiliation so the treaty of versailles is the document that stands in marked contrast to the march 1st 1919 declaration of korea because uh, the treaty of versailles is premised on revenge humiliation othering etc um and this the march 1st declaration is pointing another way an alternate path um and it's sort of like that's where the spirit of the peace through law movement is is rearing its head at that moment on the peninsula that is how i look at it and you see like we began the show by saying this is a like a different narrative it's it's a broader narrative and the traditional narrative is like anti-japanese nationalist movement for independence and i would like to say that this is um for me more of a international movement in the project of developing international peace and justice and that this document and what happens is pointing to another way and reminding us of that if only we're aware of it <laughs> so, so um we've been going for almost 90 minutes we will um start to to wind down here and we've talked about like this issue of where do we enter the forest with this story, um, Woodrow Wilson, the Dong Hop Peasant Revolt. Um, you know, when, when Woodrow Wilson's words hit the consciousness of Koreans and they start to organize. And I also wanted to mention, I would be remiss if we did not mention, because Randy, you talked about um, all these different people doing things all over. Also Korean students in Japan, <laughs> they organized something called the February 8th demonstration that they're then they they issue a declaration which is not forward-looking if you will it's sort of like the same mindset of othering and violence and so forth and so it's an interesting project to contrast the february 8th declaration which was really written um by young people who were very angry versus the march 1st declaration which is you know it was more senior persons were involved in in that and um uh, but even even on in Japan, Koreans were organizing to do something, and that really put the pressure on people in the peninsula to do something. 
So then the question is, where do we exit the forest? When does the story end? So there's two core questions always, where do we enter the forest and where do we exit the forest? And I just want to say we're still, like right now, um, we're still like dealing with the story and the consequences of unkept promises, as, as Randy pointed out, um, and the country is divided. And there's like this piece of the story, when Americans understand uh, this piece of the story that the United States divided the country, and by the way, the United States and other countries had pledged to help Korea and we really didn't do it. Um, this sort of changes the whole perspective, at least for me. And I know what has happened for other people when they hear the story about like how to deal with North Korea and the unification of the country. And so uh, I think that's, that's uh, the legacy that we still have that work to do that the, this March 1st declaration, which is a declaration of the peninsula before it's divided. Again, this is 1919. We need to be mindful of that. Um, and Pyongyang was like one of like, it's sad because like in South Korea, when the March 1st movement is discussed, Seoul is the centerpiece of the narrative, but really like Pyongyang and what happens in Pyongyang um, and Namgang Lee Sung Hoon, who, who's like in, and Hamsa Khan is in Pyongyang when he participates in the March 1st movement. So there's that whole, um, other lens that we, we need to be mindful of when we're, we're moving forward with this project of, of peace and justice. I'll stop and then I'll turn it over to Michael and then Randy to close out this conversation. No, I just would like to first say and encourage all the listeners that I think this show really encapsulates the power of history and the power of working against to further diminish one's own ignorance. Like you said, hope is a lifelong project and that it is in a way your duty to help and try to string the beads together. And so then you may come to have an understanding of this history so that you may then fully participate in the relay race that is the whole historical project of human history to further it on along for everyone. So then that the next generations are able to take it, take up the baton and carry it forth. And then I wanted to thank you, Hope, and you, Randy, for being the docents of this history and helping to educate me on many of the more minute parts and really to string it together on the grand red thread of peace history and how it all ties in. And no, I am very grateful for that. So no, thank you both. Cool. Um, so on the subject of kind of exiting the forests, you know, I'm I'm going to walk out, you know, maybe two years ago when, or three years ago now, when Korea, North Korea was in the news all the time. Everybody was worried about a nuclear arsenal. You know, that's really where I imagine this focal point uh, in my mind is, you know, this thing on the news all the time. What is, you know, what is going on in North Korea? And, you know, I remember asking people then, you know, like, so why do you think Korea is in the news right now? And there's never really a good answer beyond the surface. And so as we, you know, as we're leaving this forest, we can kind of do one of those look over the shoulder moments and, re and remember, okay, World War II, United States drops bombs on Japan and Japan surrenders, making their colonies something that go to the negotiating table and their colonies get divided up and one of their colonies is Korea. And so Korea gets decided to be split in half and the Southern half, the United States becomes responsible for, and then the Northern half, the, uh, the Soviet Union becomes responsible for. And why is that divided that way? Well, you have to look all the way back to the stuff we talked about at the very beginning here where there was a bunch of conflict happening on the Korean Peninsula in the 1890s and then the Russo-Japanese War. Like in 1904, there's this, there's these moments that, that don't just go away because we don't know them. And in, in the process of remembering them, we start to have a coherent understanding of why Russia would be interested in North Korea 
during at the end of World War II? Like, why would they care? Well, because 50 years ago, they were trying to get access to that place anyway. And it turns out it just, it ended up happening at the end of the World War. So, or the Second World War. And so it's, it's useful to think about, like there's this long thread that forms this chain that we can then understand and integrate into ourselves so that the next time something shows up on the news channel that we don't understand and we think we understand, but we can't answer a simple question about, we can start to educate ourselves and start to look to history as a way to make sense of the world we live in today. Thanks, well said. And uh, I just wanna say one last thing if I may, um, and that is like, how did we, myself and Randy, come to know this? And, and Michael, you know, you thanked us. And I, I want to, you know, express thanks to Andrew Dixon White and Andrew Carnegie because and Bertha von Suttner, like all of these people who were part of the Peace Through Love movement and who, who got me and Randy in The Hague and, you know, looking at the Peace Palace and Peace History, which made us look at the E. June Peace Museum, which is also in The Hague, to which Randy referred earlier. And that's how I learned about Korea and um, was, was through The Hague. And I find this when I'm working uh, in Korea, in South Korea, I have such a different um, framework that I didn't, like, I'm not a student of, quote, Korean studies. Um, or East Asian politics or, or things, things like that. It's rather through following the thread of, of peace history. And so that's what really informs my understanding. And of course the March 1st movement is, is, a, is a bead on that string. So I'm so proud and honored to share this March 1st with you, Michael and, and you, Randy. Um, it's, a, it's a somber time because of COVID. Um, the celebrations in Korea are a bit subdued. And the relationship between Korea and Japan is very strained. Um, so conversations for another day. Please check out our show resources page at virtuesofpeace.com and do a deeper dive. Just spend an hour with the Yu Guan Soon documentary or 20 minutes reading the Yu Guan Soon article and begin to yeah, excavate this deeper thread. And, and not only, as we said, is it your duty, but hey, it contributes to uh, satisfying your core need for meaning to see yourself as part of um, this movement in history. So thank you. And we will back, be back soon. And happy March 1st. Bye-bye. <laughs>